All right. Anyone who knows me knows Pantera was and is my favorite band of all time. In addition to recording their albums, they were also known for producing videos of their performances uh, and music videos, which contained behind-the-scenes footage. There was one particular one called Pantera 3, Watch It Go, and it was unlike anything I had ever seen, a film where it's just behind-the-scenes footage of a band partying and hanging out with other rock stars. It was really quite incredible to see at the time. The man who was behind the film and who worked with the band extensively is our guest today, Bobby Tongs. Bobby has worked with, uh, in addition to Pantera, a lot of other notable heavy bands, including Slipknot and Marilyn Manson. And he's been good enough to take time out of his day in Dallas, Texas, to speak with us. So how are you today, Bobby? I'm good. Good, Jesse. How are you doing? Yeah, look, I'm I'm very well. A bit of a time difference. It's 9 in the yeah, morning good here. good morning. <laughs> yeah, so just pumping a couple of coffees. So I, I'm very excited yeah. to do this, but I think a few cups of coffee will um, – it'll make it more, more visible in, in the tone <laughs> of my voice. So, um, All right. <clears throat> so look, as I said, you, you were – you know, people who listen to the band and know these videos already know who you are. But do you want to just sort of explain your role with the band and, and what you do with yourself these days? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I was born in Kansas originally, and uh, my parents moved to Texas, to Arlington specifically, around 83, 84 uh, for work. And so, of course, I moved with them. I was, I was in junior high then, just starting. So, you know... Uh, so we moved here and I uh, started going to uh, this junior high in Arlington called Gun Gun Junior High. Um, and anyway, that happened to be right by Daryl and Vinny's mom's house. It was on my pathway to walking home. So as I walked home, I'd hear rumors in school about a band that was getting started over off of Monterey. That's the street they lived on. And, uh, you know, eventually I'd start hearing noises after school and I'd be in there jamming. So me and my friend, uh, Brett would walk over there and, you know, just stand around and listen for a minute and walk on home. And then we'd come back, you know, the next day and <laughs> they might be outside hanging out and we'd go up there and talk to them. You know, this is a like 84, 85 projects in the jungle and uh, I am the night type of stuff when yeah. they still had ter- Terry Glaze. So. So anyway, I got to know Daryl and Vinny that way and uh, started going to shows around here, the ones I could sneak into. So, um, you know, and over the years, I mean, I, did, I started going over there a lot and hanging out and listening to them uh, rehearse and practice. And and uh, Daryl gave me a camera one day and says, you know, you want to start filming a little bit? Let's do it. So had a big old VHS camera and we started filming some stuff and that's pretty much how I met those guys, you know? And, uh, from there, you know, the, the rest is history, I guess. They say. Right, indeed. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, that's how I met the guys and all, you know, early days. I didn't realize that, that they were, you know, when you saying that they were doing projects in the jungle, were they, were they recording these, these pre at co albums when they were still in school? Um, yeah, Metal Magic for sure, and Projects in the Jungle, I believe. And I think they all may have graduated by the time uh, I Am the Night came out. But yeah, yeah, their dad had a studio here. In, actually, it's Arlington, but it's a small little town that's called Pantigo. Okay. They have, have their own police and everything. So anyway, that's where the studio is. So they were... And you had said they were living with their mom, so were their parents separated yeah. at that point? Yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, a lot of people don't understand the, as I said, I was just in the States last year, but it's pretty hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around when they call it, you know, uh, the, the Dallas Fort Worth area. And then Arlington is sort of stuck in the middle between there. You want to just give a brief overview? It's, it's effectively like three cities in one now, isn't it? Oh, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, Dallas in the east and Fort Worth is west and Arlington's right in the middle, you know. Um, it's uh, 80 miles of city, <laughs> pretty much, <laughs> nonstop, you know. Um, I don't I don't know the population exactly, but 
Arlington is is close to a million these days. So wow. Dallas and Fort Worth are way up there, you know. But it's North North Texas. <laughs> so, um, you know, the band explodes when Phil Anselmo is becoming the front man. But for a lot of fans, they're aware that there is Terry Glaze, who was uh, the singer beforehand, and they know that this is uh, more of a glam era of the band. Um, you want to take us through, you know, a little bit of the sound and, and the influence of the time and, uh, and ultimately, you know, why Terry ended up leaving the band? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't know the specifics. I know he just wanted to go in a different direction for him. But, uh, as far as, uh, the glam and all that, um, you know, they were just, they were just the, their kids, you know, 17, 18 just rolling with it and uh, doing what they love to do and having fun. And they just happened to dress like, you know, Van Halen, uh, whoever else was out there at the time, dressing like that spandex and all. But, you know, that's what they saw and that's what they, that's what they lean towards when, when you're a teenager, you know, you're going to look at other people and people you look up to and that's where you're going to get your first sense of style, you know, mm. So that's what they did, you know, but the music was unbelievable for, for kids that age. I mean, you can put those albums on today and listen to the music and the, the song structure and the solos and the riffs. And I mean, it, it holds up to some of the music today, most of it. <laughs> did they, um, uh, the, the brothers, did Diamond and Vinny have a, a bit of a repu, reputation as musos or, or musicians when they were in high school? Like, were they considered really good back then? Yeah, yeah. Vinny was in the, uh, Vinny was in the marching band, I know. Yeah. So he was, he was, everybody looked up to him a lot for, for drums and all. <clears throat> Daryl was, I don't think Daryl really played that much in school. He, he took a summer out and just learned everything. He locked himself in his room and put on a kiss and Van Halen records and just learned them. And he learned, taught himself to play that way for a, for a summer. That's, you know? what, that's what I'm told. I, I read he locked himself away and came out as sort of a virtuoso. There's yeah. a, <clears throat> yeah. there's also another story that, that had floated around about um, Dime entering, you know, local guitar comps around the age of 16 or so. And, um, I think he, he ended up winning a Dean at the time, which is sort of how that became the guitar before yeah. Washburn, but all getting to the point where he was kicked off the local circuit for being too good. Do you, do you know anything about this or is there any truth to that story? Uh, it's, it's true. I don't know a whole lot about it. I mean, I know he did win, win a Dean. There's a, there's a newspaper article out there with a picture of him holding it up. You know, I, I've seen that. I never really asked him about it. I mean, but he, but he did win several contests around there until they just wouldn't let him enter anymore. Yeah. Like you said. But that, that's all true. Yeah. Um, yeah. He is, he's pretty, pretty amazing for his age. Cool. And what was the reputation of the band? Um, you know, what, when they're producing these independent records, I'm from my understanding is that they, they ended up developing a huge reputation on, on the club scene, but that was also sort of yeah. based around having a little bit more of that eighties glam sound uh, at the time. Yeah. I mean, people around here loved it. I mean, all of Texas, they toured in Louisiana, Oklahoma, uh, did a couple shows in California. They, they were, they were taken off, you know, um, they would sell their records of course at the shows and stuff. So, so they were very business oriented back then, mm. you know, more, more so than the latter years yeah. <laughs> where they had people to take care of it. But, uh, Vinny was a business mind, so he, he always took care of everything in that aspect. But, but they, they had a huge following around here and it just got bigger and bigger. You know, when Terry left and Phil was coming on board, there was a little lapse in between there, but people still came came to see him with all the different singers they had, but, but you know, and then Phil came and it just kept, kept growing after that, you know? I hadn't realized that. Were there a lot of singers in between Terry and the transition to Phil or different yeah, guys yeah. filling the gap? Yeah, just filling in. They didn't want to stop playing, you know, so, cause they, they would play every weekend and saw Saturday, Friday, Saturdays, 
Friday, Saturday nights everywhere, every weekend. So they didn't want to stop doing that. They, they got a, there are a couple guys that tried out like four, four or five that I know of that right. just didn't cut it, you know, so. So what? So they fin- finally found Phil. Between Terry to Phil, was there like was it a year gap or something uh, sort of between? I think it was a shoot. Yeah, it had to be yeah, probably right. a year at least. Mm. I mean, uh, from that last independent album, "I Am the Night," that was uh, eighty six or eighty seven, I think. So mm. yeah. But then, of course, power metal was eighty eight. But anyway, there's um, I've I've still got an old videotape of Dime jamming with Carrie King from Slayer, probably in around nineteen eighty seven or something along there. Yeah, and I've also seen a photo of Dime hanging out with James Hetfield from Metallica, probably around that same era. Um, yeah. What yeah. Are, the the gaps that I'm trying to fill in is obviously Pantera didn't have a mainstream record deal, but Metallica and Slayer did. Mm-hmm. So was Pantera that well known on the local scene that they were hanging out, or 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 they had already developed a bit of a name that they were hanging out with bigger established bands back then? Yeah, yeah. I mean, Daryl and Daryl and Vinny loved uh, both of those bands, obviously. So. You know, Carrie came out. He would come when they were in town. He would come to the shows. Uh, he, he came to a few Pantera shows back in 87, 88. But, um, yeah, I mean, they were in the Metallica thing. That was back. That was when they were recording I Am the Night. So that was way early. Not way early, but that was like 86 or 87, maybe even 85. Mm. But anyway, uh, it was just through mutual friends that they all got together, you know. And, you know, somebody told James and Lars about these guys in Pantera and they checked, they went, they came to a show at Savvy's and watched them and then, you know, went, went over to the house and they jammed and everything. And mm. my friend Stuart, who lives right down the street from me now, he, he's the one that took all those photos. So. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Stuart Taylor. And when does uh when does Rex come into the band? Because as I said before we started recording, um I I remember reading an article this well this probably would have been fifteen years ago when um uh, when Vincent Dimes' mother had passed and there was a statement from Rex saying that you know it had hit him really hard because he had spent a number of years living with them at the house and she had become like a second mum to him. So uh you know they had had a couple of bass players before Rex came in. That how does he link up with the band back then? You know. I'm not even totally sure, but he was there for the whole, whole time, you know. Every record he's on, he's on all the independent records. He's on, uh, obviously everything else. So, so he was there since 83 for sure. But I think he knew him before that. He was, he went to school with Benny and Daryl. So I, I don't, I don't know the whole story of how he got in the band. Mm-hmm. I'm sure I've heard it, but. <laughs> No, I just never absorbed it, I guess. And do you remember his opinions on stuff like spandex? Because I've seen articles where, where he he is adamant that he didn't want to wear that stuff, but it was sort of what you had to do to play in the band back then. <laughs> did, were, were they, did they all buy into it, or is he kind of a uh, is is he adapting the, the truth? Uh, did you see his hair back then? I did. Yes. <laughs> and there, there you go. That should answer all of it. He, he didn't have to do his hair that way. Fair nobody enough. made him. Nobody made him do that. <laughs> but like I said, you know, they're looking up to their to their idols and stuff, and they're young. So yeah. look at look at yourself when you were sixteen and you're. Oh, you're, they're horrible photos, aren't they? They're t- yeah, they're, they, you know. they stay in the vault as much as they yeah. can. <laughs> <laughs> you try, but it doesn't always turn out well when you're that young and looking looking back at things. Huh. So you know, yeah, Rex. I don't, Rex, he he just they all seem to go along with it. You know, nobody yeah. was like the head honcho on it. I don't think so. So did Rex go to the same school with 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 them and yourself then as well? Yeah, uh, I think Rex went went to. Uh, I think they all went to Arlington High School together. Okay. Those, those three, they're older than me, so I was still in junior high. Right, okay. Um, we, you had talked about how they were living with their mom and they were separated from their father. There's still, 
uh, from what, you, despite that, there's still a lot of information about the band, um, having learned a lot from their dad and their dad being a, a country record producer and having these studios as well. Um, what was the impact on him and was he close with the brother still growing up despite the, the separation of parents? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they recorded all their independent albums with them. And yeah, he, he definitely taught him the, the, you know, the, business side of of uh, music when they were young and got them their instruments and got them playing you know and started them out and you know being a dad he taught them as much as he could i'm sure um he didn't live far away when they were separated so they always they were always in contact you know mm. i i wouldn't say daily because jerry jerry would get busy with his uh projects and stuff but you know, they were in the same city, um, and all until Jerry moved to Nashville in, shoot, I think, 93 or so, 94, mm. maybe. But anyway, they, they, yeah, yeah, Jerry was a big influence and helped him with a lot of stuff. And um, as I said before, af- you know, what, after Dimes passing, Rita Haney became a, a big public figure, sort of the the spokesperson for the dime legacy, but I, I didn't know her um, mm-hmm. prior to dimes passing. Did you, did you grow up with her? And, and she's sort of, she's pitched as dimes girlfriend, but at the same time, that seems odd to me mm-hmm. for a band that toured so extensively. Yeah. Well, she was, she was always, she met Daryl and Vinny when they were she probably seven or eight or so. And went to school together, but but she's not. She knew Daryl from early, early on, and yeah, they they were boyfriend girlfriend. She lived with Daryl, you know, from the uh, uh, from when he bought his house on. So you know, twelve years or something, fourteen years. Mm-hmm. She lived with him, uh, but yeah, they were always together. Really, I mean. They had their ups and downs here and there, but but they were they were together pretty much the whole time. Yeah, I mean after after the independent albums, I would say. And um, you know, you're you're still doing or or finding footage and and mixing and, and editing for the the Dime Vision videos, and I believe that she's part of them. Are you are you still in regular yeah. contact with her? Oh yeah, yep, yeah. yeah. We do a lot of that stuff together. Um, like I said, she's been around since day one, since since before before me for sure. You know, she was already she already lived here and went to school with them when they were kids and had known Daryl. I mean, they knew each other probably until they were. I don't think they got together until their twenties. You know, okay. but she knew him well before that. So, so yeah, I mean, and like I said, she lived with him. I was, I mean, I even lived it. Carolyn's house for a while and Vinny and Daryl's and Rita was always there, you know, she worked a lot to keep up our drinking habits. She was a bartender. (laughs) She was a bartender. So we'd always go see her and, uh, you know, (laughs) that helped (laughs) back in the day. But yeah, Rita was always around. She still is. And I get along with her and we do a lot of work together to keep Daryl's memory alive, you know? It sounds like a, a lot of the, the core crew and, and people associated with the band are still based in that Dallas-Fort Worth area these days. Is that so? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I would say so. All right. So we're, start, we're starting to get into now, um, you know, backgrounding uh, on the origins of the band and how they get started and everything. Now, um, at some point, uh, was did Terry decide to leave? He wasn't kicked out or anything. Had the band in... So the... The story as it's told is sort of Phil comes in and he brings this sort of grunge and hardcore attitude. Was prior to Phil coming in, was the band already adapting its sound or does Phil play a large role in, in developing that sort of more harder sound? Uh, I think both. They were, they were definitely growing and growing, going in their own direction, a uh, um, harder direction for sure. But, uh, when Terry left, you know, and, and Phil came in, yeah, I mean, Phil, Phil brought what, Phil was in Razor White, um, if you've ever heard of that band or know anything about them. I've heard them, but like, I've never, Phil, I've never got my hands on a demo or anything of them. 
I, I really haven't either, but I think they were similar to what Pantera and Terry were. You know, I kind of I did a lot of covers and a lot of glam style originals and stuff like that. So they both were kind of in the same boat, I believe. And uh, you know, it just clicked when they met up, and they they it was like a new started a new fire, and, and I definitely did. And, and this is around eighty nine. You know, is that sort of what eight, you would? 87, 88. 87. Yeah. It was pretty, uh, it was a pretty magical thing to watch it all develop. You know? What was your uh, impressions of him when he came over? I, I'm told that he, um, it was a telephone <laughs> call or something. He hops on a bus from New Orleans, pops out there. I think he's, uh, he's, he's a few years younger the, than Vince. Um, <laughs> he, the, the story is that he says that he brought this hardcore edge to the band. I mean, what are you, what were your first impressions? Of Phil Anselmo back then? Uh, the first time I saw him, it was just a show, you know, and he came out on stage and it, me and my friend looked at each other and were like, oh, God, I hope that's not the singer. <laughs> really? Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How come? And uh, I, I don't know, just a, just an impression, first impression, I guess. <laughs> but he just looked, he, was, he had like on the first time I saw them, with Phil, he had on like, uh, God, I got pictures too somewhere. He had on like a white tank top and like these flowery Hawaiian shorts or something. Yeah. And it, it just looked ridiculous. And we were like, oh no. But, but you know, he was, I, I don't know. That's just, the, that was at Savvy's in Fort Worth. And that was uh, our first impression. But, but once they started playing and stuff, you know, they they still did a lot of covers. I mean, that's all they really knew with Phil. So, so they didn't start playing the newer stuff for you know five or six shows in. But yeah, it was it was interesting. Times times are really really different. You know, these days, just like you and I are doing, you can hop on Skype, you can record albums from different points around the world. Mm-hmm. You know, going back, what is it, eighty eight, ninety eight? Going back over thirty years ago now. Yeah. There's a bit of a commitment to hop on a bus and say, yeah, I'm just going to join your band. Did, did they gel a, a, immediately at that point in time? Or, you know, was, it sounds like yeah. a pretty big step to just cross the state lines and say, I'm going to come live with you and we'll be part of the band now. Uh, they all wanted the same thing and that's what they had to do, you know. And and I'm sure if they didn't like each other, they didn't think it was going to work, They would he would have turned around and went home. But, you know, I think he stayed at Carolyn's for a while, which is – Pretty much where we all would stay, <laughs> yeah. Occasion- occasionally, but uh, so that really became like the a, a clubhouse for everyone to hang out. At, at that yeah, but not everybody at once. Really, it was just different times. People needed places to stay, so it would always be like when I stayed there, I would sleep in the four track room out in the garage or on the couch, but usually out in the garage when it was nice, so yeah. I could get a, get away from everything and <laughs> lock the door. But anyway, anyway, with Phil, yeah, it, he he stayed there for a while, and then he got an apartment, which was right over by where I had an apartment with my friend and his dad. And the studio was right behind our apartments, so it's like he would walk through our apartments to get to the studio every day, you know. And there's like a little path behind us through a fence and down through a creek, and there's a studio on the other side, so. We all lived lived close, and we all hung out. We spray painted his entire loft when he moved in. <laughs> we had a big spray paint party. Uh, looking back on it, that was pretty crazy. Um, spray painted the ceiling, the walls, everything. Just drank the whole time. Had a blast. Um, yeah, he had to repaint when we, when he moved. I think. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> but anyway. The, the scene would have been a lot different. Um, you know, I, I don't think I'm telling any lies anymore. He- heavy metal, I mean, festival-wise is popular, but it doesn't. You, you don't seem to see the same sort of you know leather jacket, um, Reebok high tops that you would have 30 years ago anymore. I've heard a lot of bands though around that time that there was such the, the music was quite popular that you could gig like every night, do matinee shows. W- were they playing in clubs daily and, and moving around? How active were they as a band back then? Uh, every weekend for sure. Yeah. You know, some, maybe sometimes on Thursdays, but definitely every Friday and Saturday, whether it was, 
whether it was Dallas, Fort Worth, uh, Houston, Austin, uh, Louisiana, you know, Oklahoma, all the, all the cities around here. I mean, lots of Oklahoma places, lots of Texas. Yeah. Shre- Shreveport and Louisiana, you know, they were always playing. Yeah. I mean, they, they never stopped. I, and that's how I got started. I'd start going with them on the weekends once Phil joined the band, you know, and I'd just start filming. So, okay. So they're, they're, I don't think I've seen that because I, if I go back to the Cowboys from Hell video, there's some footage on there, but so there's, there's all this footage that dates back to sort of pre 1990 that you've got your hands on as well, eh? It's, it's at Daryl's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so Phil joins the band, the sound begins to change. What, what do you remember sort of of that period of the evolution of the sound and what's sort of going on in between the independent albums to when they end up getting the deal with, um, I think it's Atco to do Cowboys from Hell? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it definitely changed. I was I was pretty surprised when I first heard Cowboys from Hell. Um, I didn't know what to think of it at first, but as I listened and saw them more and more times, you know, I was pretty amazed with it. But uh, that's that's going a little too far, I guess. But uh, power metal, though, in between the independent with Terry and Phil's first record, power metal. Power metal, I heard, I think the first song I heard them play from that was We'll Meet Again, which I loved. And I still love that song to this day. But, you know, it was different. There was a lot. I mean, I was, like I said, I lived right by them when they recorded it. So mm. we were down there, down there bugging them at the studio, you know, knocking on the door, taking pictures, doing things like fans would do yeah. while they recorded. But uh, anyway... You know, we could hear it, and they they gave us would play us uh, songs and stuff in between breaks and all. But I mean, it was definitely a jump in a different direction that I'd never really heard. Mm. And then from that, going to Cowboys from Hell, you know, it was another step in a different direction that I'd never really heard anything like it. And I just knew from. From Power Metal and Cowboys, I knew that they were going to be a huge band and people were going to love it. So I was on board 100%. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, sort of a, of what I've read of the reviews of it around the time period. So, you know, for, for mm-hmm. listeners back then, like, uh, as I said, I got into them in the mid-90s, but I remember there were magazines, you know, Metal Edge and Hit Parader that, that you buy on, oh, yeah. on the stands and and some of the articles dating back to right then were saying that they couldn't place the sound. It was, it was quite odd because 1990 yep. were looking at that transition between glam to grunge and they came out with this pretty heavy record, but still with these sort of, uh, a lot of falsetto, uh, vocals that sat on top of it. And they weren't quite yes. sure what to, you know, what they were thinking out of this album when you've got stuff like domination and cemetery gates on the, on the same album. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was crazy. It was, it was, uh, yeah, nobody had ever heard anything like it that time. I mean, the Cowboys from Hell riff was like the weird Texas playing riff type I, of thing. I still think that's with a weird a bunch song. Of metal. I agree with you. you. Know, it doesn't, Cowboys from people, Hell is still an odd song to me. People just didn't get it, you know, and then <laughs> there's like Psycho Holiday and things like that that were just, crushers you know and people in domination like you said it's just it was just something totally new and then the energy they brought you know mm. with all with the shows was was off the charts also and people loved it you know so th- there is um there's actual the, the story is and there's video footage online of this um the story apparently is that after cowboys from hell comes out um, Pantera is starting to do, you know, uh, national tours of this. And, um, there's an interview, uh, I think I dime and, and possibly Vince or dime and Phil and dime is on, I think it's much music Canada, if I'm not mistaken, he's being interviewed in Toronto oh. and he's wearing, um, uh, what's the, the Judas priest necklace. He, he's, um, uh, the uh, British steel, British steel, um, thing. And Rob Halford sees this on, on television live 
and some and they're all and priest is touring Toronto as well um, at the time and and says who is this guy I want to meet him and that becomes the first introduction of how yep. Pantera gets on the Judas Priest bill to open up for them is and a lot of people say this was really the thing that that initially broke the band after being on a major label and am I correct with that and do you want to tell me a bit about this period yeah yeah I, that's totally true yeah we were in Toronto I believe. And, uh, yeah, he came out to the show the next night and, uh, the night after they did the interview and he had seen it, he came to the show the next night and met them all before the show. And he got up and did a song with them oh, yeah. and we were all like shaking in our shoes. I was trying to film and sell t-shirts at the same time and nervous and going, wow, what if I miss something or the camera breaks or this or that? Cause it's Rob Halford playing a song with these guys and they never had anything like that. And everybody was nervous, but he came out and I think, you know, they, they all, they loved it. They got along and Rob stayed in touch with, with everybody and took him on a European tour after that, you know, with, uh, Oh God, who was it? It was, it was Judas Priest and, uh, Annihilator. Oh and, yeah. Another great Canadian band. And, and Tara, yeah, and a couple others, but yeah, that was, that was the first European tour they ever did. There was, um, and, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, no, that's fine. It was, uh, I think we were at the end of our, uh, Pantera Exodus Suicide. Pantera Exodus Suicidal was the first major tour in the States that they did. Mm. And I think it was at the end of that one was when they met Rob and then went to Europe after that. And yeah, there's um f for a lot of people who dislike the band or talk about their glam roots. One of the other things that they pin on the band is that they stole Exhorter's sound. I'm sure yeah. you've heard this argument. Do, do you? Oh yeah. What uh, you know the the albums came out roughly at about the same time. Is there any mm -hmm. truth to this? What's your take on this? W were they influenced by Exhorter at all? I mean, everybody probably influences everybody, but I know Daryl and Vinny didn't really listen to that kind of stuff, you know? So if anything, it came from Phil, but Phil, I mean, they were making, they were putting together, you know, they just met and they were putting together these songs and stuff. But I, I mean, I think it's a little, uh, I don't think they stole anything from anybody. <laughs> yeah. Actually, actually. So Fair enough. I don't really know how to put it, but I'd, I'd never heard of Exhorter, you know, until, you know, 94 or something. I'd never heard that story. So yeah. I don't know if it just came up later or after Panther had success or what, but, but you know, every, everybody can, you know, everybody is influenced by Black Sabbath. You can hear that in Pantera's music, you know. Sure. Um, Van Halen, you can hear that in Pantera's music. But so, whatever, you know. I mean, some, some, you know, just not here nor there. <laughs> um, you know, we're talking about Pantera touring with Priest in 1990. And I don't think, if I'm not mistaken, it wasn't until what, 97 or 98 where Halford came out of the closet as, as being gay. Was that, uh, um, I assume obviously the band would have known through touring with him. Was that a, a bit of a, a shock to them? It's, um, metal's never been, um, the, the most sort of welcoming genre of music for, for these sorts of things. No, nah, I don't think it was a shock. I think they all knew before, you know, he always had a, had his guy around hanging out, you know, and his guy. it wasn't, a, <laughs> wasn't a big deal to anybody, you know, yeah. they, they all kind of knew, but you know, nobody, nobody cared. He was still the metal god. So, so nobody, nobody was really surprised. Um, what's surprising to me is, is over the years, um, there's certain clips that have become quite popular. And one, one of the ones that has become enormously popular online after Dime's death is the, the festival that they did at Monsters of Rock in Russia after the collapse of communism over there. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the videos is, is domination. I, I remember when this was around, but this has seemed to take it on a life of its own on YouTube and in the amount of views that it has in particular with the solo that Dime's playing from there. Um, what do you, 
what do you remember? Uh, so just to clarify for everyone, you were on the road with the boys across this entire time period for their career and were with them mm-hmm. there the entire time, effectively. I, I didn't get, me and the cat did not get to go to that show. Okay. Because we were in California. <laughs> oh, so what were you and doing they, there? They got, they got the, I was visiting a girlfriend. Okay. Um, but, uh, they got, the, this is back in 1990, so there was no, you know, cell phones or anything, but we got, they got the call, you know, and a week later they were on their way to Russia, less than a week, you know, they accepted and took off. So I got a call from Daryl saying, dude, you're going to miss it. <laughs> you're going to miss a big one. And I'm like, well, I just got here, and, you know, I can try to change my flight. And I'm just like, you're not going to make it anyway. I just wanted to call you and tell you you're going to miss this thing. <laughs> like, just kind of like, rub it yeah. in your face almost, it sounds like. Yeah. He's like, don't worry, though. I'm taking the camera, so you'll see it all. And all he's right. like, watch, watch, watch on TV for us. So anyway, yeah, I didn't make that one. That was just one show in the middle of uh, – they were just starting to record uh, – Vulgar display of power there. So right, okay. So um, uh, you know, people that people that know the band, vulgar display of power kind of becomes the the pinnacle album. It is a, it sort of bursts out of nowhere and immediately develops a following. And from what I from what I've read and, and can remember, this is really the album that puts Pantera on the scene as like the band. Um. Between, you know, how did the Cowboys tour finish? And then what was sort of the outlook going into the, the studio to record that, that second major label album? Um, so it finished with uh, pretty much with that Monsters of Rock show. You know, that was pretty much the end of the Cowboys from Hell touring cycle. And that, that they were just starting to write Vulgar Display of Power when, uh, oh, sorry, that's my dog. That's all right. He's choked. He's okay. Good, good. <laughs> he drinks water and he chokes. He has a collapsing trachea and chihuahuas. Right. And they'll drink, they'll drink water and it closes and he's got a cough to get it back open. But yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. There you go. Mo. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they were just, uh, they were ending the Cowboys from Hell Cycle and, and uh, they got the call to do the Moscow show, and then they were writing Vulgar right then. So they came home and uh, got in the studio after that. You can imagine uh, the uh, adrenaline they had after that show, you know, and how excited they were about the future and, and the next album in general. So mm. that's that's when they wrote Vulgar Display of Power, you know. And was, so... Uh, Again, you know, we're talking about you being involved with the band at the time, and you were surprised by how Cowboys sounded. What, well, what were you thinking when they were doing Vulgar? Because again, Vulgar is another step of heaviness and continues to get heavier through the duration of their career. What were you thinking when you were starting yeah. out, this album was being recorded? Uh, I, I just knew they were going to top Cowboys. You know, I didn't know how, or, or I just. I just knew they would. I mean, Daryl coming up with these riffs. He he played me uh he played me an early version of Walk and I was I was like I didn't I didn't get it and I told him that. I'm like, I don't get it. What's the how's that beat working with that, that riff and this and that. And it was it was different. I still have the demo here somewhere. It was like a four track he'd written. But uh but you know, I heard that. I think that was one of the first ones he played me. But um, it was just different, you know. And I knew that he that they would work it out when they all got it in their hands and put their touches on, put their separate touches on it. Mm. And it just turned into a beast right off right off the bat, you know. The um in in the 1990s, sort of when when I was a teenager. The, Two the the two biggest producers that I can remember in the metal scene were Terry Date and Ross Robinson. Um, Terry was Pantera's main producer through all those albums, and you know was doing work with guys like like Deftones, and, and I think he added a really sort of powerful, crisp sound to them. What what was the relationship with the band, and and what did what did Terry bring to the table in terms of you know forging this sound for them? Uh, he brought 
all his, uh, you know, obviously his expertise and, and he's just a character, you know, they had a great time with him. Um, he was fun, fun to work with, you know, um, uh, you know, he just, he was just that extra ear to come in there and, 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 you know, knock things back and forth with them. And, you know, I mean, they, they had the, the ideas and, and he got, he got the sounds, you know, they knew the sounds they wanted, but, you know, Terry just helped them get there. Some, um, some bands book studio time and sort of write when they're in the studio and, and other ones have got everything they need to do and they go in and record and they're done. Uh, was Pantera one way or, or the other typically? Oh, sorry. What was that? I'm sorry. No worries. Some, some bands pretty much have their album done and written before they go into the studio and other bands use the studio time to write their album. Did Pantera do it in one, one way or the other typically? No, I think they, they, it was their dad's studio. So, you know, like I said, everybody lived near the studio. So they would just go over there and write and record, you know, I mean, they, they definitely got songs together and demoed some stuff, you know, Mm. before, beforehand. And then they went in and just before they called Terry, you know, and then they brought it all in and just, you know, arranged it. And we did a few things here and there and recorded, you know, and so the um the the big question or another one of the um the mysteries that exist there and depending upon you know which which band member you ask you get different answers did the guy on the cover get punched some people have said that um you know the, a fist was just placed there and uh, other stories say he got what 10 bucks per punch or something do you remember how the cover was done <laughs> uh they did it in new york um and uh uh, I, we don't really know. I mean, <laughs> me and Daryl were getting back these pictures because Daryl was, you know, the art guy too. So me and him were at his mom's house and they'd send us these photos of this guy getting punched and we were like, <laughs> what is this? This looks like he's barely, he's like barely hitting him, you know, and Daryl would call management and be like, you, you need to punch him. <laughs> you need to, you need to punch him really because he's, fist is all crooked and weird looking and it doesn't look like a real punch you know so yeah. so they'd send more photos and more 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 uh mock-ups and and me and daryl finally just we just started doing our own we took all the photos and everything up to kinko's oh, yeah. <laughs> do you remember kinko's copies it's like a big big copy store here in the states which it's like the fedex copy place now but we'd go up there at two in the morning because they were open all night and we'd have all of our stuff laid out on the table, scissors, tape, you know, markers, whatever. And we'd, we'd make our own covers, but, uh, we almost had this one, which was, uh, it was, we just distorted the guy's face a bit and we turned the fist into a sledgehammer. Okay. And it, and it was, uh, that almost made it. I mean, I still have the, uh, the actual mock-up that the record company did with the, you know, the color beads on the sides and everything. Okay. That, that, that almost made it, but, but nobody else liked it except us. So, <laughs> so that didn't work. Out. But, but no, me and him were, we were on it. But yeah, as far as getting punched, I, I mean, he might have gotten hit a little bit, but definitely not punched, bare fisted. Well, that doesn't leave me clarified much more. I think Vince said, yeah, he yeah, punched, got punched exactly. 30 times for a 10 or 10 bucks a pop yeah. or something. But that, that's, yeah, that's the rumor. <laughs> um, the other thing I, I wanted to ask you about because, uh, in when I was the, the key time period that I was listening to the band in sort of, you know, the, the mid to late nineties, um, was that Dime, Dime was on Washburn. So he originally started with Dean, then went to Washburn, but now it seems that Dean has all the rights and, and people these days seem to associate Dime with Dean guitars. Do you, yeah. I, I don't know, do you have any take on that? I just find it really interesting because um, I remember him as a yeah, Washburn I mean, guy. Yeah, I was with him, you know, through all that. He started with Dean's, like, you know, he won the Dean. He, uh, he always bought Dean's early, in the early days. He had his couple specific ones that he used most of the time, his Lightning Bolt and uh, a couple others. Um, 
but you know, uh, uh, I don't even know when. I think it was maybe '94. Washburn started picking him up. Mm-hmm. They, they sent him a couple offers and they made him a bunch of guitars, and you know, eventually with him and and those guys working together, he came up with something he liked, you know, and they wrote up a contract and they signed him to Washburn. So he did that for what, 10, eh, not 10 years, probably four or five five years. He did that. Mm. And, you know, then he just, he wasn't happy with what was coming out of him, you know, for retail, for retail sales or his own personal guitars. So, Uh, okay. And his extension was, or his contract was up, so he was, you know, he went back to Dean. Because you know, I, I remember a mate of mine even had um, one of those life-size cardboard cutouts where he had the yeah. the the green washburn, I think, flipped up upside yeah. down. There, oh, there yeah. merchandise from that time period. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Dean Dean Zelensky left the company for a long time too. So, you know, and that was at the, the time when Daryl was with Washburn, but when. Dean came back and Daryl's contract expired. I think that helped, you know. Yeah, right. And uh, Daryl always loved Dean, so. Okay, interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so, a Vulgar Display of Power comes out. Uh, I remember reading, I think it debuts at number 42 or something, but this is really the album that, that puts the band on the map and sort of identifies them as, as the band coming out. Do you, do you remember there being, um, I guess recognition or applause for the album oh, yeah. on its release. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, everybody, we were all excited, you know, we were excited to go on tour. Everybody was in their early twenties and just ready to go. I mean, we, uh, we started the, I believe the tour started with Skid Row and, uh, it was Pantera Skid Row and, and that stuff every shows night, up in the videos night. as well in, in the second <laughs> yeah. video. Yeah. Okay. That was a great, those guys were so cool to us. It was such a learning experience to go on tour with the, it was, they were an arena band at that time, you know, and, and it was, it was out of control every night. But Pantera went up there and destroyed the crowd for them. And then they went up and did their thing, but you know, it was all in good fun. Um, like I said, we learned a lot from them on that tour as far as everything, you know. What does that mean in in the aspect of a touring band when you say we learned a lot? Like like what what do your eyes just, get opened uh, up to? Just how professional the crew crew was, you know. The crew, um, you know, as far as dressing rooms, you know, getting towels, the rider, you know, passes, whatever, everything. You know, they're so not living their, in a van from yeah, place to place. They had, their, they had their shit together. And this was the first, first, uh, arena band, like I said, that we had ever toured with besides the little Judas Priest thing in Europe, but that's different in Europe. But anyway, you know, um, and they just showed us the way, you know, pretty much the rock and roll way. <laughs> do you notice this is sort of the point where the band is, is ascending? Like, do you, do you see the band starting to really grow a fan base now or, uh, did, did oh, that, yeah. 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 For sure. Um, you know, there'd be kids around our t-shirt booth, you know, all night, you know, and after the show, you know, they'd be around our bus. That's how it started, you know. I mean, even on the Cowboys from Hell and stuff, the band would always go outside the bus when we didn't have a dressing room or anything, or you know, which mm-hmm. was never back then. So we'd all be around the bus, and they'd just sit out there, and we'd drink beer, with, drink beer with the fans, and you know, <laughs> sign autographs, take pictures, hang out with the kids for two or three hours every night, you know. And that's how. That's how they started their fan base, and that's how it was pretty much until you know the day it ended. Okay. I mean, so we um, it was uh, it's it's not long between albums; it's two years. So Vulgar comes out in ninety two. Uh, Far Beyond Driven comes out in ninety four. Far mm-hmm. Beyond Driven, I would still say, has the most different sound out of any of the albums. It's um, 
there's certain songs I really like on it and certain that I don't. It sounds a lot more like a jam album to me, despite how heavy it is. Um, uh-huh. What do you remember about the album? And, and I, I guess seemingly how how big the band gets in this time and going back into the studio to record this? Um, yeah, they, this was the first album they did away from uh, Pantega Sound. So they, like I was telling you earlier, their dad moved to Nashville. Uh-huh. Um, in 94 or 93 but uh, anyway he uh, he opened up his own studio there so that's where they went to do Far Beyond Driven they recorded that in Nashville um, and yeah I was during that time I stayed home quite a bit and uh, I was uh, what was I I was doing I was working on the home video for vulgar while they were recording that so i was doing we were doing a lot of fedex and back and forth and stuff like that me and daryl but uh so i wasn't there the whole time in nashville with them but but yeah when i heard it i was like this is another another album that's totally different from the last Mm. you know and i mean and it's one of my favorites so i thought it was better than you know than vulgar but right but but different i was just i was dumbfounded again and I, I couldn't believe it i'm like holy you know holy shit they, they keep doing it and were you surprised you know, by how heavy they went on it i think that, that that's what a lot of people yeah, say on I, mean, it. Yeah. I mean you know i was i was surprised by all of it by the sound by yeah the heavy heaviness of you know strength beyond strength the becoming squeal i'm like there's there's <laughs> another si- signature song that nobody's ever heard of or you know heard that type of thing before so there's that one for this album you know and then that was walk or cowboys from hell for the others but it's like you know i was yeah i was i was blown away by it cool. just like everybody else i think um how does the band, because I mean, the three home videos starts talking about the, you know, this, this album goes on to debut at number one and it's still as far as I, I can, I can tell the heaviest album to sort of get that position on the charts. Um, my understanding is that this was quite a shock to everyone that it went that high up. What, what was the, I guess the reception with the band and the expectation of what this album was going to do? Yeah. I mean, the, I mean, we were all surprised, I think, that it went number one. Um, you know, it beat out people like... Uh, Ace of Base is the one oh, I remember. God. Yeah, Ace of Base. Bonnie Rayet. Bonnie Rayet. <laughs> so he was... Competing for the same audience. Back then. Yeah. So, I mean, it was it was a surprise to all of us, I think. I, I got the little billboard thing over there framed, you know, the number one thing so I, I look at it all the time but yeah it was it was definitely a surprise i mean we did promote the shit out of it though you yeah. know we went we went on a uh we released it on in march i think of 94 and we did a we did a, a in-store tour for the band it was me the band big val and I think Walter and a record company person. Mm-hmm. We had a pri- we had a private jet and we did like yeah, right. 12, 12 cities in 10 days or eight days or something. Like we'd have two of these huge in stores a day to promote the release of this thing. And those in stores were completely packed, you know, 3000 kids, 4000 kids lined up down the streets and stuff. I remember this know? from the videos. Yeah. You guys filming all, yeah. all this sort of stuff, speeding up the camera yeah. as it goes around the block. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We did, we did those for, you know, eight days or something. And, and that, I know that helped a lot. That was a big uh, push from the record company, which, which that doesn't happen much anymore, but Anyway, that we did. They did a lot of in stores in general, you know, not just when this was released. But MTV got a hold of Far Beyond Driven too, and they they really promoted it for the first time, you know, when that came out. They had Headbangers Ball at the time, and they came out and did a bunch of stuff for this. So, so this is the um like, like there were two prior videos, but I three the three home video I think is is sort of the 
the, the biggest and best of all the home videos. It's the one that sort of really lets yeah. us into the band and shows us people like yourself and, and other members of the crew. You mentioned Big Val. I, I know Walter O'Brien is in the video. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I've, I've read that this, the three home video in particular, heavily influenced the jackass guys to start doing the, the work that they're doing. That's what I've heard. I've heard a lot of people, um, like people close that, that said, uh, uh, Jesus, I'm here to bring for it. That's um, all right. Steve-O, Steve-O, yeah. yeah. Steve-O said to, to people before that he, he got the ideas, you know, some of the ideas from the Panther home videos. And Daryl, Daryl knew that. Daryl was fine with that. He's, as you see in Dime Vision 2, he, he lights him up for a second on it. <laughs> Steve has, so uh, Daryl knew about it. But, uh, also, uh, the dude from Girls Gone Wild, um, the one that got in all that trouble. You know, the Girls Gone Wild. I remember series. they used to advertise them at midnight. Yeah. By, he yeah. said, uh, he said he got his idea from a heavy metal home video. He didn't say the name of the band, which is ours, I know, because we have tits flying in and out of there every 10 <laughs> seconds. So. But, uh, but, yeah, me and Daryl finally got to do what we wanted with that video, you know. We did the first two also, but we weren't really as hands-on as we were with the third one. Three is together. something else. It's it's like yeah, being on thanks. tour with the band. Yeah. The, the, the first two is yeah. just sort of – watching yeah. some behind the scenes footage and three feels like you're actually going on a, yeah. it feels like you're backstage with the band. It's got a very different yeah. feel to it. It's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we worked hard on it, but it was a lot of fun working on it too. It was just, it was me and him and we'd get up every day and drive to a studio in Dallas and we had an editor there with us and we'd just sit back and laugh our asses off and, you know, <laughs> edit this stuff with him and oh we wore out some editors though that's for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool yeah. so what yeah. um what happens to all the all the personality i remember you know we'll, we'll talk about a few of these names uh, i mean uh, big val uh security walter o'brien who is uh i, I think a and m or, or part of the record label you got sterling winfield who goes on to produce cat the the tech I'd read an yeah. interview with, with Vince that said Big Val ended up stealing and trying to sell merchandise and got canned from the band or something along those lines. Yeah, I guess. Um, he, he did a few things like that. He, uh, I think he was trying to promote his, his own brand or something. And he was trying to, he was going to give away an unreleased Pantera demo of the great Southern Trend Kill or something. So. Yeah, that didn't fly with anybody, so he got canned on that. And we had heard before he did something to that effect with Black Sabbath. So, All right. but, but you know, in the later, he, he's just still working in security and stuff, just not with Pantera anymore. Mm. After uh, what the Great Southern, after Far Beyond Driven. So, okay. yeah. and then um, when uh, what maybe about five years ago now, there was a, a picture book released by Pantera with um. Sorry, I'm going to have trouble pronouncing his name. Joe Geron, I think. Yeah, Joe, Joe Geron. Joe Geron. And, uh, yeah. Rolling Stone does an interview with, with Phil and Rex on it. And there's a, there's a picture with Walter O'Brien there. And Phil says what, what seems to come across as a disparaging mark about Walter O'Brien was, but in the home videos, he's, he's portrayed as sort of this, the suit and tie guy that you sort of bring along to the party. Right. Yeah. He was a manager. He was, he was the band's manager. So. He was from uh, Concrete Management, and you know he was with them from Cowboys from Hell on. So um, I don't know what remark you're speaking of in Joe's book, but I I didn't really read all the stuff oh, in that book. But 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 yeah, I mean everybody was well, you know they were in good good spirits up until the end, I believe. So you know. Of course, with any band management relationship, it gets a little weird at the end. But so know, it's, it's it was, around this um, <laughs> around this time period that that Phil breaks off and does down as a side project. Well, you know, we over time we will find that once the band breaks up, down become after doing a number of other projects, down becomes the the major project for Phil. Um, was it 
was there any indication at all back then that this would become something bigger or be become one of the wedges within the band? Mm, not really, but yeah, actually, a little bit, yeah, you know. The, the, the two brothers always, they, they wanted to stick 100% Pantera, obviously, and they, did, they didn't mind. They are like, go ahead and go do it, you know, and get it done, and get it out of your system, and let's get back on with, with the next album, you know, with Pantera. So, so you know, it went on and on, and, and uh, Bill was taking his time with it, so they kind of, you know, got a little little worried about it and uh, finally you know they got back to recording the great southern trend kill so we'll talk about you know, that in a, in it a was moment. a little it was uh, yeah it wasn't it, he wasn't supposed to uh, keep touring on that record you know yeah. he was supposed to do a few little tours and release the album and come back but that's not what happened. So fair enough. Um, we'll take a little bit of a segue because this is really the, the time period of the band that I recognize best and have, have the fondest memories of. And, um, the, you know, going back on, on some of the other things that, that say in sort of, um, you know, the, the, bro- well, I guess all, all of them, I think Rex was in on as well, but being fans of, um, <clears throat> sports as well, you know, they were fans of the Dallas Cowboys. There are some, pretty hilarious band photos that I've got of, you know, them on golf courses with Vince with a cell phone holder and they're wearing, you know, golf caps and all that sort of stuff. Um, and importantly, I guess one of the bigger things that comes out as a Canadian for me is their love of, of hockey and the Dallas stars. You want to just talk about, you know, their interest in sports and, and the stars and how this relationship comes along. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, well, growing up in Arlington, Vinny and Daryl, you know, they they're always big fans of the Cowboys, so that's a given there. With and we'd always go to the games together, and you know, just get rowdy and have fun. But uh, and to the to the day Vinny died, he would always throw parties at his house for any major sporting event, even even just games. You know, he'd cook cook food and invite people over for. But but going back to to the stars. Uh, Back when they won the Stanley Cup, yeah, that they they, uh, they wrote the theme song for the Stars. You yeah. know, one of the guys, one of those one of those nights, the puck off, I believe it's called. All, all together, yeah. One of the Stars were like, "We need the theme song," and and they were about to go to the Stanley Cup Finals. So Vinny and Daryl were like, "Well, let's go write one." So they went home that night and they wrote that puck off thing, and you know. Um, I think it was Daryl and Vinny and Grady Sterling recorded, but I think it was like four or five people that did all the cheering, the Dallas Stars, uh, the chorus part. Dallas yeah. Stars. It sounds like a crowd of 100,000, but it was like four of them. <laughs> but any, anyway, so yeah, you know, and then, and then they won the Stanley Cup that year. And, uh, and they brought it back to Dallas, and Daryl and Vinny and Grady and uh, Crusher were in the parade in Sterling. They were all painted themselves green and got up on the float and did the Stanley Cup parade with the stars. And uh, they had parties over at Vinny's, of course. This is probably what you've heard about. I want to talk about the, um, believe- <laughs> the, the legendary story that – yeah. During the celebrations, Guy Carboneau throws the Stanley Cup off Vinny's roof, I think, and it gets damaged along the pool. Something along those lines. Yeah, it, it, it happened. It hit the side <laughs> of the pool. Let's see. I, did Vinny tell you it was Guy Carboneau? I always thought it was Eddie Belfour. Right. Okay. Well, that's, that is what I had read. But again, it just, just like the punching in the face of the cover, there's yeah, but a lot Vinny of hearsay. The, the guy for sure. but. If he said Carboneau, then that was Carboneau. But yeah, Ed Belfour <laughs> sounds more likely to do damage right. based on I know his. He was, I know he was on the roof howling like a wolf that night, like screaming at the moon, and and they couldn't get him off the roof. But, but yeah, they had they had a lot of fun. They'd come out to shows too, Pantera shows, and we just you know you know how we were on the yeah. home videos. We would drink and party after the shows and. And it got crazy quite often, but there are some, um, 
I'm, I'm always I'm always amazed at who, like when, when watching clips or something, who pops up to mention the Pantera Boys. I remember I went to a music festival in probably 97, 98 when I was in Calgary, and Foo Fighters were there, and, uh, and Dave Grohl, in the middle of a segue in between songs, was talking about drinking and just goes off on this tangent of hanging out with the Pantera Boys and, and Dime. Someone else had told me that Britney Spears would even be invited to parties and re- got along really well there. And the videos show a number of uh, people who you may or may not necessarily associate with that sort of music absolutely loving these guys. Are there any particular individuals that you kind of remember you go, that was, that was an, that was really interesting that they managed to get on like that. Um, it doesn't really surprise me that much anymore. I mean, uh, I mean, back then, you know, the Rob Halford thing was really cool. Obviously. Um, I thought Skid Row was really cool. You know, they were like high and mighty to me back then in 1990. And, they really enjoyed Pantera. Um, but yeah, the Dave Grohl thing, he came out to shows back in, you know, 94, 95. He was, I remember one at the Long Beach Arena that we all got hammered for, and he stood behind Vinny playing the drums the whole night. You know, he had a pair of sticks and he was air drumming back there with Vinny. That was, that was really cool, you know. That was when Nirvana was doing their thing still. But, uh, you know, there's, it's, yeah, it's just a crazy crowd of people that have heard of and love Pantera. Mm. All right. So we, we start moving into, you know, the, the later part of the nineties with, um, Trend Kill. Trend Kill's my mm. favorite album. I think it's the greatest album of all time, in my opinion. Awesome. I just, I, I, I remember I had a, when I was in, when I was in high school, uh, I hadn't heard the album yet. And there was a guy that I was hanging out with and he dropped into when cars still had CD players and from go zero, it's just chaos. They're screaming. <laughs> it's, it's just yeah. over, over the top, right? Right from the first minute. Um, I was listening to this again last night, you, you know, tracks like, uh, underground American Warner were probably two of my favorite Pantera tracks of, of all time. Um, but this yep. is the, the band starts to go through a pretty, tumultuous phase around this period in time um uh-huh. i think phil is starting to break off with the band uh does he does he have is he already into drug addiction at the moment or does this come after trend kill because we know he goes he has a he has a heroin overdose and from my understanding mm-hmm. diamond vince were unaware that he was even using this and he's starting yeah. to hang out with a different group of people around this point in time yeah i think it all it all kind of started when he branched off and did his his own tour with Down, you know. That's that's kind of when all that started. And, yeah, we had no idea about the heroin. <laughs> we thought it was pain, pain pills for his back is what he would tell everybody. So that's not a, not a you know, and we didn't, we had no idea about the, uh, the heroin, but yeah, you know. What do you remember that? Because the, the media around it said, or, or he's gone out and said, like, I was dead for 10 or 15 seconds. This happens backstage after a show. Um, you know, I assume that, that you were on the road with them at this point in time. What do you well, remember I, happening what, at that time? Well, I mean, I remember it vividly because I was, I mean, I don't want to give it all away because I, I, I'm, st- I'm going to write a book. Okay. And I got, some, I got some other stuff, but, but I'll tell you the quick story of it. He was, uh, we were in the dressing room after the show and I heard his assistant out there. I heard him start screaming, you know, and I, I ran out there and I'm like, what, what's going on? He's pointing to the dressing room. He's like, Phil, Phil. And I ran in there and he was laying on the ground and I, I picked him up. And held him, you know, and I was looking down at his, his, uh, shoulders and his head was resting on my shoulder. I had him from behind picking him up, you know, and I, I shook him a little bit because it was, he said it was a drug overdose. And I'm like, okay. Um, and as I looked down at him, you could see his skin was turning blue. It was like bluish hue. And I, I'm, and I'm yelling at people to call the paramedics and I grab water. I was dumping water on him, you know, and I'm holding him this whole time. It seemed like forever. And finally the paramedics get there, you know, it seemed like it was probably five minutes or 10 minutes, but it seemed like an hour. But 
Anyway, they get him on the couch, and they put the uh, oxygen mask on him and, and, you know, start working on him and and uh, giving him the, uh, you know, uh, they get him on the gurney. They wheel him out to the uh, ambulance, and, uh, you know, they took him to the hospital. And, you know, they said he was going to be all right before the ambulance left because they – you know they did their thing, but but yeah, he was he definitely wasn't 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 alive there when I was holding him. He was cold and blue, and it was re- ridiculous. You know, Daryl and Vinny were standing in the doorway, just like they couldn't believe what was going on. You know, nobody could. Everybody was standing around, like what what do we do? You know, and, uh, yeah, it was just a bad bad scene there. What happens after that? He goes to hospital. I assume you know the, the revelations that he, that he's a that he's a heroin user who needs to be, uh, I guess, resuscitated to bring him back to life. What, what's the aftermath of that between Phil and the rest of the band? Um, no, I mean he went to the hospital. Um, we all stayed in Dallas that night. We had a show in uh, San Antonio. I think the next day. Yeah. Yep. So we all stayed in uh, Dallas that night and waited for him. And he got out of the hospital the next morning. And he said he wasn't going to miss a show. And uh, so we all drove to San Antonio and we get there and, you know, we're going about the day the way we should. And he uh, calls everybody to the catering room, all the bands. It was, uh, Jesus, was it White Zombie? Is that when that tour is going? Yeah. Yeah, it was White Zombie, Pantera, and uh, I want to say Static X or something, but maybe. maybe I think that's too early because Static X, I remember from Extreme Steel, Um, so it's probably White Zombie. Maybe Typo Negative or Uh, Anthrax or someone around that? Because I'm trying to think of the major tours that they're doing. It was a three band bill. Anyway, he calls everybody in, you know, and. He gets up on the, on the, this little stage thing and starts telling everybody he screwed up and he's never going to do that again and this and that and on with the tour and he apologized to everybody and that was that, you know? Mm. And the rest of the tour was fairly decent, you know? But he doesn't stop that, using, he, he carries on using as we know. Yeah. yeah. What um I, I can't I I think this was was ninety six so so Trend Kill's already released by then I'm I'm talking they're they're touring off Trend Kill at the moment are they not Yeah Yeah Okay So let's let's go back and talk about the album itself Even was there uh was there any disagreements with the band at the time because even this album I remember Phil Anselmo is recording vocals I I think in Trent Reznor's studio in New yeah. Orleans while the rest of the band is recording in Dallas. Are, are things, is there, is there tension at this point in time? Well, you know, a little bit because they're not all together, but, um, you know, they could tell on the phone when he was fucked up and stuff. So they knew, you know, but he wouldn't come up and do the, do the vocals there. He wanted to stay in New Orleans, which, you know, he did. And yeah, he did all of it there. And uh, the guys recorded their stuff at Daryl's house, at his studio, behind his house. So, you know, that's just the way that went, you know. He did his thing down there, and, you know, he came up and did a video with us, the Drag the Waters video yep. that, that we did. And, you know, and after that, we went on tour, and, you know. What did you, th- and all that. What did you think of the album? As I said, to me, to me, it's it's it's... I adore that album and no one else who listens to Pantera thinks they think it's too abrasive. They don't think the songwriting's there. I think it's really got a lot of that sort of hardcore edge to it to a lot more. I mean, mm. what's your impression of the album and, oh, and also yeah. the time period? Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely got that edge. It was it's like I said on the last far beyond driven from uh vulgar to far beyond driven. It took that jump. And then this one from, uh, Far beyond to the Great Southern Trend Kill is just, it's another step and it's another uh, sound, you know. Mm. They did something else different and I was blown away by it. I'm like, 
you know, the great Southern Trim too and Floods I loved. I, was, I mean, I love the whole album, but, you know, I was just, uh, it was just another, another jump into this different world, you know, a mm. different type of album because they all, all their albums are different. They all yeah. sound different. They all sound like they could almost, you know, I don't know, be a different band almost, but Indeed. obviously not. They're still Pantera, but you know, it's like they're just so different. They all have their own sound, their own, their own, their own, uh, attitude, their own animal, you know. Indeed. So it was definitely different. And I, I mean, I loved it. I went to, uh, me and Daryl and Vinny went to LA and, uh, and we were mixing it at this uh, studio and this was a hilarious time in our life uh, we rented this car and it happened to be a Lexus and anyway we just we just tore this thing up we tore the panels off the sides I mean we were still we were staying at the La Park Hotel it was just it was just a fun 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 thing you know and I was out there filming and and they were you know we were uh Mix, mixing the whole thing, and it was difficult to mix just because of the, just the, just the, the high end and the attack on the There's a hell it's of a lot of squealing on that record, yeah. It's, but, it was tough. Uh-huh. And we sat there and we'd, we'd sit out in that car and play the music, and, you know, Rex came in after a little while, and, and we all just, we mixed it all, and we all just had a blast, uh, driving that car up and down. You know, all through Hollywood and pulling that break in the middle, Daryl will just pull it when Vinny's going 60 miles an hour and just reach <laughs> over and grab the, the break. And, you know, <laughs> here we go. But, um, <laughs> were you su- stuff. the other thing on the vocals, um, all the backup screams are done by, uh, Seth Putnam from a, from another band called Anal Cunt at the time. Was that a bit of a surprise to the band that he's, cause he's sort of littered all over the record with additional screams. <laughs> Uh, I don't, I don't even, I didn't even know that that was a thing. <laughs> Seth Putt. Yeah, I guess you did do a few of them, huh? Um, this, um, this time I period. Thought, I thought the Phil's vocals on this, this were, I thought they were awesome. I mean, they had Trent Reznor there, you know, and he was probably, <laughs> he was helping him a little bit here and there. And, well, they're slightly different. I, I don't know. I just thought, yeah, I thought they were, they were, uh, they were progressing and, and, and more up to date and just, they were really cool. I really liked them. I really liked the vocal things. Well, Far Beyond did. Driven is almost like him trying to do death metal. And this is him almost like trying to get those mid range screams as violent as possible, I guess, as you could call uh, it. Yeah. Yeah. This, it was, it was I, I, I love the vocals. So. The the other thing that's happening around this time, and again, I, I remember this because, you know, when I'd buy Hit Parader and stuff, you'd get the pull-out photos that were in the middle of the magazine and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know... I still up, have a list. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, prior to that, I, I remember, you know, uh, Phil's in his plaid, Dime and the boys are wearing their Dallas Cowboys gear, and the, the Abbott brothers and Rex don't really change, but Phil starts to take on this sort of meaner look with the torn pants, the dark throne patches, and seems to really get into a lot of extreme music, black metal, and the anti-Christian stuff starts coming out a lot more at that time period. Do you, was he yeah. just influenced by the black metal scene or was there a notable, noticeable change in his personality? Because it comes across in, in the media around that, that time. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was just, you know, doing his thing and being extreme and listening to the most extreme things he could, you know, and I'm sure the, uh, the other influences didn't help too much mm. as far as drugs, you know, but he was, he was getting out there a little bit, but you know, he's doing his own thing. He was just, he, he was attracted to all the death metal and everything like that. So yeah. that's what he wanted to do, you know? So his whole death metal, he likes, he loves it. <laughs> and, and what about these tours going on at the time? So at, around Trendkill, you know, you know, you spoke about the tours. I, I remember, um, tours like, you know, Pantera and Sepultura, Pantera White Zombie was another big one. 
opening for Sabbath on the reunion tours, Pantera opening up for Metallica in Mexico for a couple of shows. Mm-hmm. Ozfest is huge around this time period as new metal starts hitting. Um, any particular tours or stories, you know, ha- hanging out with, with Ozzy or Peter Steele or any of the stuff, uh, of, you know, when they're in their heyday. Yeah. I mean, they were all, they were all in our dressing room drinking, you know, <laughs> every <laughs> night. So we all, we always had a blast, you know, no matter who it was, but, uh, yeah, the ones that stand out, I mean, typo for sure. We had a lot, a lot of fun with those guys and uh white zombie too, of course, we would, we would screw with Rob and, and, uh, Sherry so much. <laughs> Carol would, Daryl would sit on the bus with a walkie talkie. He'd wake up, you know, hungover from the night before. He'd get up and see my walkie talkie and grab it and just start talking all this shit into it. Like, ah, there's a devil on the side of the bus sucking, sucking a dick out here. We need to get some fucking security out here ASAP. This motherfucker's going off, you know, and just start his, his whole rant and, Sherry'd get on the radio and she'd be like, we don't use profanity on the radio. <laughs> They'll be, well, somebody needs to come get this devil sucking this dick off the side of the bus. <laughs> just, just go off on, and it, I mean, it was hilarious. He'd do it daily when he would get up, you know, <laughs> that early, but we had a lot of fun with them, you know, the Black Sabbath, uh, the, the Kiss one, the Black Sabbath one was awesome. But that was after the Kiss reunion tour. Yeah, which I think is I on think, the second video. That is that what that was? 97. Oh, right, okay. 98, when they, the original members got back together. So is that when they're doing like Psycho Circus or this is a reunion tour then? No, no, this was, this is all the original members. They right. put their makeup, put their makeup back on for the first time in, you know, 25, 30 years and started their reunion. Uh, we did all Mexico with them. We did South America with them. And that was, that was probably one of the highlights of the touring career, you know, was that me and Daryl got a two liter of, uh, seven up in Mexico and pulled, poured a whole bottle of, uh, well, we dumped some seven up out and poured a bottle of Seagram's in there. <laughs> so we had this huge two liter and we went out and got two rows behind. So, so we weren't in the front row and distracting anybody, but two rows behind, uh, Ace Freely. Yeah, right. And we just sat there the whole night, the first, the first night of that tour, and we just passed it back and forth, drinking and loving the show, you know, and singing all the, all the lyrics like little kids. That was probably one of the most amazing moments. Awesome. Of my life, you know. Yeah. Watching them walk out down the hallway in their boots for the first time and, in all those years, you know, it was like, holy shit. You know, they came in the dressing room, poked their heads in before they went on stage. We're like, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> is there a, so that, that was cool. Ha- having toured with all of those bands, is, is there, um, you know, they talk about bands being able to hold audiences or, or rabid fan bases and that sort of thing. Is there a particular band of those guys that, that sticks out to you and you go, man, that they're, they're really sort of, you know, the, they're at the top of the game that they are the, you know, the pinnacle of this sort of thing. Um, how do you mean? Like now? Well, I, well, I, I mean, um, so as, as an example, like it's, it's notorious apparently that when Slayer plays that the openers all the way through get booed until Slayer gets on stage. The people that are there are there to see Slayer and no one but, mm-hmm. and the last Slayer shows have been amazing. The lots of, uh, huge explosions and fire. I just mean, uh, is is there a band that that's tight that has the the biggest fan base that 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 when you play with you, you just go wow people are really into these guys. Um, I mean, obviously Slayer has their their own fan base that that you know that can't be touched. But <laughs> Pantera's was one of a kind, I think. You know, they. Uh, the fans and the band and the energy and it was just, it was an unrivaled type of thing, you know, and the relationship the band showed to the fans, you know, we threw, threw beer to them. Yes. <laughs> Daryl, Daryl, you out in the crowd, you know, just, and after the shows, you know, everybody would hang out. So it was like, it was a, it was a, it was quite the thing, quite the anomaly, I believe, but, 
Yeah, there's no other bands that do what Pantera did with their fans, and there's no other fan base mm. like Pantera, I believe. All right, so we, as, well, we start moving on to um, Reinventing the Steel, which ends up becoming the last album that the band does. Um, again, as you talk about different sounds, I, I completely agree with you compared to a lot of bands pantera makes each record sort of stands on its own i i always thought this album sounded a bit more like their uh arena rock album if you will it's heavy with sort of particular tunes i have to admit even though it's one of my favorite albums now i didn't particularly like it when it first came out it sounded it sounded a bit different the production is a little bit different and of course that's moving on to sterling from terry date um what what do you remember about this album? It sounds a lot more like the band is handling this internally as opposed to, you know, outside influences. Yeah, they def- definitely were. Um, I was, at this time, I was on tour with Slipknot for the first time uh, okay. in 99, the end of 99. Um, so let's let's just talk about that for a moment. How, how did you get into that role? How do you end up touring with, with Slipknot and working with them? Uh, when Pantera was done, um, we did that tour in 99 with Black Sabbath, and um, I met, well, from the previous OzFest, I, we had a relationship with all the the uh, Osbournes and their people and everything, so the Osbournes were managing Coal Chamber. Yep. Which is, uh, was, you know, Dez and them. So they called me after Pantera got done with their tour and wanted me to come out and do some filming for, for, uh, Coal Chamber. I know exactly so, when that is because, um, yeah. when Slipknot did, when they broke at OzFest 99, I got to see them in around October when they were opening for Coal Chamber with Dope yeah. on a separate tour. So I'm, I'm thinking yeah. that's around the same time period. Yeah. It was right. 99 there at the end of 99 i believe but yeah i went out and they did their own headline thing it was uh coal chamber headline machine head opened wait slipknot machine head coal chamber was the order Hmm. so yeah i I was out with coal chamber on that one filming for them and i just got to know the guys in slipknot and they they were fans of pantera they loved them Love the home videos and all, you know. So they're like, you got to come out with us, Paul, Paul and Joey and Sean. We're like, you got to come with us. Yep. So, you know, as soon as that tour was over, uh, I went to, uh, I think the first tour I did with, uh, Slipknot was we went to Japan. Okay. And they, that was the first time they'd been out of the States. Right. So we did, we did that and, uh, we did a European tour after that. And that's when, uh, Somebody from one of the labels came out and uh, gave me a sampler <coughs> of the reinventing the steel, like a like a like a demo type of thing, a couple songs. Yeah, and they played played it for us on the bus, and we, we were all like, "Huh, you know, it, it was a little different." But I think the songs on there, it was. We'll grind that axe for a long time was one of the songs they played and, and Revolution is my name. We all love that, but the but the great you know, it just took it hit me weird and everything since I was on tour and with them in Europe. So you thought know. it was a bit strange too then? When I first it was heard a, it, it was different when I first heard it, yeah. It it yeah, seems it, to it seems to be a bit more straightforward without some of you know, like the hooks and uh, I don't know. It just, as I said, it sounds a little bit more like their version of a of a stadium rock record, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, but like we were saying, they're all different, you know. Mm. So they they did something different on this one. When I got home, I had finally got uh, to hear the whole album a couple times. Somebody, one of the labels, gave it to me, and. Uh, so I got off tour with Slipknot and I went straight to Texas where well, I lived here and uh, I went to Daryl's and then we started back up filming, filming for them and we were all in the kitchen one night and, and they, him and Phil, me, Phil and Daryl, uh, of course I hadn't drank. I, I drank, you know, in that amount of time, but not like Pantera drank. <laughs> So are are they party. still the heaviest drinking band? In the oh, media, yeah. would always portray them as just these 
voracious alcoholics. Yeah, but you know, we we took care of business, that's for sure. Yeah. But yeah, we we drank. <laughs> so I get back to Daryl's and, and we started drinking and him and Phil were in there grilling me about the album, like, what's your favorite song? And I'm like, I think I'll cast a shadow and they're like, Yeah, how's it go? And I I'm like singing lyrics to them and stuff. So they're I, actually what's, quizzing what's testing other, you on this. What's your other yeah. It was yeah, like right. a test. I'm like, I got the album. I heard it, you know, the label gave it to me. And they're like, yeah, we know. And they're like, well, what's your next favorite song? And I'm like, Uplift. I love that song, too, you know. Yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay, cool, you know. And they're like, all right, yeah, you heard it. You know, and they just just up my ass about what I thought, you know, and everything. <laughs> it was a pretty, pretty cool moment, you know. Yeah. But, just getting back and seeing them. I hadn't seen them in months, you know, and, and everybody was gung ho, you know, everybody was ready. So there's a, there's a pretty positive outlook when, when they oh, get yeah, back and totally. yeah. they were just finishing the album, you know, and they were, they were mixing it and about to send it off to be mastered. And, yeah. So how long do they tour out. that? Cause it, it, I think reinventing the steel comes out 2001. Am I correct? I think about 2000. Yeah. 2000. Yeah. They tour off it for a couple of years, okay? Because this, um, yeah. th- this is the time period, and when things, th- this is where I got to see them towards the end of uh, of when everything breaks up, and it seems that there seems to be some stresses on the band. So I'm, it's interesting to say that that they had a really positive outlook initially once mm-hmm. they took the, once they took the record live and started touring on it. When do do stresses start to appear on the road then during this tour? Um. You know, not really. I mean, I think things were getting better at this point, you know. I think, uh, you know, it was after all the great Southern train kill, after all the, supposedly after the drugs, you know, and then um, we, uh, uh, sorry, I was just like, um, anyway, yeah, it was after, they were, they were they were totally positive about starting a new album cycle, you know, about getting this one out there and seeing what the fans thought. And they were excited, you know, just about touring in general. And, mm. and you know, it was a good time. We, we did a lot of, did a lot of in stores again. Um, there was a few, a few mishaps here and there where, you know, Phil was out of it at in stores and stuff like that, but, you know, he he was he was uh, he was getting better yeah. is what we thought. So because people were having a good time. There was there was towards the end of it, there was, it was starting to get a little weird, you know, as far as him and his attitude, and you know, just when we went to Australia and he fell off the stage, you know. People were. Well, you, you might remember that then because I've, I, I think we're talking about the same show and I've got friends down here that saw them in Sydney and, and one of the Did things. Did we do the Cemetery Gates video there for, for Creep Show or some shit? I don't know. I wasn't but living I, here back yeah. then. So I'm, I'm okay, still living okay. in Canada, but, um, <clears throat> yeah. at this point in time, I've got friends who went to this show here in Sydney and there's, and, and there's separate video footage around here where, he, where during this period he's going off on these white power rants in in between songs and the, and the, I remember guys saying like yeah he was really fucked up and all of a sudden he just starts going off about like white power stuff and there's there's a video that you can still watch online where they're performing in South Korea and they're performing something from reinventing and in the middle he just goes white power what the hell is going on <laughs> at, at, at this point in time uh, you know I never done. I never really paid attention to it. if he was doing it. I guess none of us really did. But I mean, he, you know, he did his own thing. He was he was off on tangents, like like you know the the uh, just the way he just I don't know. You know, <laughs> he did his own thing, and you know, a lot of the times we just we definitely didn't condone any of it. I mean. We were just perplexed at some of the stuff that came out of his mouth, just like anybody else, you know. But, you know, it wasn't like a regular occurrence or anything, so we didn't really notice. Mm. But, I the, mean, we, we did notice the, the, the drugs and 
things like that as that tour went on. In the beginning, though, everybody was gung-ho and having a good time, you know. How, how did you guys try to handle that? Then I assume, as you said, you know that he's still using at this point in time. How do you, how do you try to manage that? Because as I said, one, one of the shows I've seen and some of the footage that I've seen, he's, he's really messed up in some of these later shows. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, Daryl would go in there and talk to him, you know, man to man and, and tell him, you know, and, and he'd agree with Daryl and, you know, it's a drug user. It just wouldn't stop, you know. You know, he would, Daryl would, Vinny, everybody would constantly talk to his assistant. And, you know, it just, just one of those things that nobody can control except the person doing it. And that person has to want to stop or they're just not going to. They're not going to listen to anybody else, you know, and that's kind of the way it was. Does this contribute to, um, I, I don't know if the tour started that way, but one of the things I had read is, is there begins to be, um, sort of a crack between the band and ultimately it ends up with, with diamond Vince on one bus and Phil and Rex on another. Did the tour start that way or, or did this sort of become a problem through the tour? No, nah, that started, I think that started a long time ago. Okay, yeah. <laughs> that started probably on far beyond driven when we had enough money to split up just because, you know, Phil wanted to play horror movies and, smoke weed all night and Daryl and Vinny didn't smoke and they wanted to play Van Halen and drink, you know? So yeah, okay. that's, that's kind of where that came from. Rex and Phil always kind of had their own bus and they, they, they were fine with that. You know, a lot of bands have different people on different buses. It was me and Daryl and Vinny security. And, you know, that was our bus and Sterling, I think. Yeah. And, you know, it was just good to have, a little bit of extra money so they can split up and, and, you know, do the things that they wanted to every night and not have to feel weird about it. And do you ever, do you ever remember, um, cause again, I've, I've always read about this band at around that time period as well. Cause you mentioned touring with Slipknot. So I think they're a good band. I like them as well, but at this, at this time period, I remember Phil going in the media and he would say pretty disparaging remarks about, you know, bands like Metallica, Slipknot, Corn and all these, and I always found it really weird because Dime and Vinny always seemed to be really positive about other artists' music, no matter what it was. Like there could be a Dolly Parton album, they'd say that that rips. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. You know, that, that's uh, that was Phil <laughs> doing his own thing again. You know, he thought. I mean, you know. He always said Pantera, the kings of metal, and that's that's what he believed, and that's what he preached, you know, every every time he could. So, but, but you know, yeah, Daryl and Vinny loved other bands and supported them all the time. Did you have um? Did you have much contact again? It seems to be a blip because it disappeared. I, I remember Phil got married for a very brief period of time, and then seemed to be divorced within a year. Yeah, yeah, that was. He had known that girl for a long time, but yeah, they they weren't married too long. But that was in the middle of all the all the bad heroin use and stuff. Right. Okay. So I'm not surprised that that happened the way it did. And so, what what do you remember as we get towards the end? So again, I, I've I, I said I saw them. Extreme Steel tour happens with Slayer and Morbid Angel. They finish that tour up in Vancouver. They do a few standalone dates across Western Canada, which is where. Uh, which is where I'm from. Uh, and I, re- I was again watching a, a video again the other day. Um, and one of the things that, that Phil says during the extreme tour, extreme steel tour is that he says, this is the last time you're going to see us for a long time and seems to suggest that the band's taking a long break or something along those lines. Um, again, I keep asking about tension because 20 years later, it seems apparent that this was going on, but it was, you know, what were your feelings as that tour was ending? I mean, there's, there, after that, uh, after, uh, yeah, when did that end? That, after that Canadian tour, we, we did Japan at some point. Um, oh, did you? So, no, did you yeah, still? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. So you still went to Japan. Okay. Because yeah, September 11th did. happens, and that seems to be the major break between. Yeah, the in August, the end of August, we did, uh, Japan, and that was the last show. But, uh, before thinking of your question, um, uh, 
you know, at the end of the tour in, in, uh, in Canada, you know, it was, of course, we were all, we were all wondering what was going to happen. You know, Daryl and Vinny were 100% and Rex, um, 100% Pantera, you know. Well, maybe not Rex. I'll take that back because he was with Down when they went out. He was, he was one to do Down. So Daryl and Vinny anyway, 100, 120% always Pantera. They were ready to go home and, you know, either start writing a new album or go back out on tour. And, you know, we obviously had that tour booked for, uh, for September in Europe. September through October, and that got canceled uh, after September 11th happened. But, but you know, Japan was fine. We all went there, did the did a day or day and a half of press. You know, Phil seemed seemed okay. He was just sat there quiet, and but he wasn't like visibly fucked up or anything. He sat there. You know, we all had we all talked. We all hung out. And everything was good. Did the show kicked its ass and then came home, you know, and waited for, uh, I actually flew on the 11th, you know, and got there and, yeah, and once we landed, we found out that about New York and that was that, you know. Mm. So we had to sit there and wait, you know, and we waited and waited and that's, that's when it all kind of, you know. yeah, it's a really morbid thing because I remember that that morning when I was still in Canada, I went out to um, – there used to be a shop called Future Shop, which would have been like Best Buy because Slayer had released God Hates Us All that day. And so I went out to go buy that record and came home. And they're like, oh, someone's flown planes into the World Trade Center. I went, wow. And then uh, oh. that seemed to put a – every from that moment in time, everything seems to have changed in the world uh, across yep. everything. Um, 100%. Yep. So what um, – the 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 band goes back. I think I think they're, they're trapped over there for like a week, and this is really where sort of Pantera breaks up now. What what from what I remember of this point in time, the the media that I was reading, this is where we get into a lot of the stuff being thrown back and forth. I'm told that both the Abbott brothers are actively telephoning Phil in New Orleans, asking him like, when when are we going to regroup? When are we going to start putting things together? And Phil is not answering the calls at all. Later on, I hear that Phil has said that they were speaking, but things just didn't quite come together. I always tend to believe the Abbott brothers on this because I, I think Pantera was their band and everything that we've talked about with Phil sort of, um, uh, confirms w- what I had always assumed about him and, and his attitude with, with the band. And it really seems like he wants to go off and start doing his own thing for a few years. Yeah, that, that was the case, I think. And they, they just wanted answers, you know. They wanted to know if they were, if they were gonna start writing for Pantera or start writing for something else, you know. So, but yeah, they, they tried and tried to call him and get a hold of him. It was either, uh, we're putting up, he's out putting up boards on his house for the hurricane coming or this or that. And they could never get a hold of him. And Daryl, being being the guy he is, he always recorded all the calls, so he's got all that stuff, you know. All right, okay. It's like if he did talk to him, it was very briefly, and nothing got accomplished, and right. you know, it was just back and forth until they're like, "Well, we're gonna we're gonna do this damage plan thing." Now, um, I'm I'm going to assume that you remember this particular piece of media because, as I said, I I would be buying Guitar World, uh, Metal Edge, Hit Parade, or all these magazines, and. During this time period, there was an edition of Metal Hammer that came out where Phil's got the knife on the cover and the caption on it says something along the lines of dime bag deserves to be beaten severely. And this seems to really have put the nail in the coffin for anything that was going to be done with the band. Do, do you remember this at all? Oh, yeah, I saw it. I was out on tour with Slipknot, but yeah, I saw it. And yeah, yeah he said he didn't say it like that, and, you know. It was that he said, she said, Phil's feud with the media, you know, yeah. turned into that. And so, so which, you know, who knows? He either said it or he didn't. But. At what, what point in time does 
do, do the brothers start deciding that? Because it sounds like Phil's already made his decision that he's going to move forward with Down. He's got all these other side projects like Super Joint going on in the background. Yeah. Uh, effectively, the the Abbott brothers are forced to do damage plan is the way mm-hmm. that that I that I understand. It. Yeah, they 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 realize he's not going to do any more Pantera stuff, so they're like, fine, well, that's that's that, you know, and they. They did their own thing. I mean, sim- simple as that. <laughs> you know, it took, they, they tried. I mean, they definitely tried. And if things would have turned out just one phone call different, you know, we might not be having this conversation. Yeah, indeed. And what do you reckon? Again, I, to me, Pantera is the best band. I think Down is incredibly, I, I think, I find it weaker. I also find Damage yeah. Plan a lot weaker. I don't think yeah. the tone's there. The anger isn't there. It feels no. a lot more sort of radio friendly. The, the sound yeah. isn't, isn't quite there. Um, were they overall, do you, th- having to adjust to that and go forward with Damage Plan? Do you, were, did you tour with them still? Were they still happy yeah. with what they were doing with Damage Plan? Uh, they were happy when they were on stage, I would say, you know, they, they loved getting up there and doing it for the crowd, but, you know, it wasn't the same, obviously. I mean, we still had fun and we still drank and hang out, hung out with the fans and made the best of it, but, but, you know, towards the end there, they knew that, that that wasn't, that wasn't the way it was needed to be. And I know Daryl wanted to make changes and, you know. It was uh, it was rough for him at the end there. Well, and and in what way? Because I had heard I, I'd read that Pat Latchman, the singer, was starting to get unhappy. There was a separate interview with Rita saying that by 2004, Dime was sort of trying to bring Pantera back together again. Oh yeah, he would have. He, he told me uh, the last time I saw him was in November of 2004. Um, I was about to go back out with Slipknot or Manson, one of the two. And I went over to his house and, you know, uh, I was just talking to him briefly about everything. And, and you know, he's, he's like, we're going to go out and do this tour, you know, through December. And then I'll see you, you know, for Christmas and everything. And after that, we're going to have some new shit going on. And, and it's not going to be this, you know. He's like, we're going to, you know, whatever it takes, we're going to get these guys back together and we're going to do it right, you know. So, sorry, is so, he talking about Pantera? Yeah, yeah. This is the last time I saw him, last right. time I talked to him. So he was, was adamant like, that after the tour, Pan- Pantera he, was going to regroup. Uh, he was saying he was going to do everything he could, and, you know, he's, he's, uh, you know, he was pretty much done with what they were doing at the, that point and wanted to move on and go back, get back to the Pantera, you know. What, what was it about Damage Plan that was sort of irking him at, at that point in time? Uh, it just wasn't. The, he didn't think the other guys were as into it. I mean, he didn't, there was no, he didn't, he obviously didn't feel the magic as much, you know, as, as he did with the other four, with the other three guys, you know, so oh. with the other two guys. Where, so, where was Rex in, in all of this between, cause it, it really sounds, there was sort of the standoff between Vince and Dime and Phil, and it sort of seemed like Rex was just out there. Was, was Rex trying to get things back together? He said he was still committed nah, to down I as think well. He was, yeah, I think he was, on board for down yeah. wanted to get away from the Pantera stuff also. So, you yeah. know, I know that I know that Daryl pretty much disowned him through that, but um, yeah. Oh yeah. He's got the phone calls to prove it. Sorry. I said, he's got the phone calls to prove it. Right. You know, so, and what did you think of Rex's book? The, uh, I, I read it when it came out, what, five or six years ago now. And the, the controversy within the book seemed to be, he, he team, it, Seem to take a stab at Vinny of being kind of a creepy guy. No, that's I, I didn't read it, and for reasons, one of my friends that's an avid rock and roller and knows everything about everything in the world of rock and roll, Tim Bland. Yeah, <laughs> he he told me uh, one of the first quotes, and it was something about Vinny being fat and uh, and all this shit, and then he's talked shit about Daryl. Like in the first chapter, and it's like, 
there's no way that Rex could talk shit about these guys. Um, it's obviously a, a, a pile of shit. I didn't read it, you know. Uh, I didn't read it. I don't want to read it. Everybody's told me enough about it, you know. Yeah. Through the years, everybody's told me what a bunch of horse shit it was and people that were there and people that know. And, right. and even Rex himself has said, yeah, I didn't want to. It wasn't meant to be that way, and this guy got it all wrong. He was telling me some shit about it, but, you know, I don't know. It's, yeah, I didn't read it. <laughs> Rex, um, within the book and later on with Down as well, which is why he ends up leaving, he talks about his own alcoholism. I mean, you, you said that Pantera is known for being the heaviest drinking band of all time, but w- uh-huh. was there any control around it? Um, I mean... Like I said, we took care of business when we needed to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but as far as control, like, do you mean like somebody? Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I just mean like no. where where you have to you wake up and you must drink because you're an alcoholic. No, 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 no. no. no it wasn't it wasn't like that on our bus at all. Yeah. You know, we drank because we wanted to. It's like, you know, there'd be. I mean, it's rock and roll. That's what we were out there for. That's why we, we had, I mean, we had a blast. We wanted to drink. We'd get up, you know, eat a little bit, catering. I mean, I'd be up all day usually. But, you know, when I got Daryl up, he'd get up and eat and hang out, you know, and do this or that. We'd go film some shit or whatever, fuck with some fans or <laughs> go, go inside and start getting loose, you know. And yeah. About 30, 30 minutes, 45 minutes before showtime, you know, he'd be like, let's crack one open, pour them up, you know, a couple black tooths and some Coors Lights, and we'd get into it, start doing some stretches. Do you just you find know? life incredibly boring now after living like that? For so- <laughs> yeah, I mean... You know, it was, I mean, you got to wake was, up and watch the morning news, and then have a cup of coffee, and you look outside. It uh, sounds sounds so docile compared to that, what what you see in the videos. That's fine. I find the world of rock and roll boring now. Do you? So I'll, okay. I'll, I'll say that touring world of most most bands and most things, you know. But it was it was never yeah never boring. Dime um. You know, we we know what happens to Dime on on stage. Um, at at his funeral, there is an enormous amount of support from the rock community that comes out to pay tribute from him. Um, what what do you remember about that? I mean, everyone was there from you know being being buried with Eddie Van Halen's guitar. Reed has talked about the sort of the state that Eddie Van Halen was in there. I mean. It seems like there was an overwhelming amount of outpouring for for Dime and his contributions to the music community. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it was it was unbelievable. I mean, the things that I remember about that day, you know, were obviously uh, sitting in there with Daryl. We, me and Rita, were sitting in the. The room we 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 did his beard all up in the morning, you know, put the pink in it for him and blow dried it, you know, and did that. And sat in there with him all day, and then the people started flooding through. Um, I remember all the people coming in and you know, talking and you know, just just an amazing amount of people and support. People from Rob Zombie to you know. Pepper Keenan, like you said, Eddie Van Halen. Um, I remember all those guys. Uh, Paul Gray, Slipknot, you know. Mm. Uh, he was right there by my side most of the night. Me and him were really good friends also. Me and him and Daryl and Joey. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, Joey and Paul would come out to the Pantera shows, and, and we'd have a blast, you know. They'd ride on our bus, and, and we'd just have fun. But... Okay. Anyway, I guess saying Paul was right there with me the whole night. Um, I got through the funeral and then went to the, uh, you know, I took him out there and did the burial thing with the guitar, my kiss casket. Yeah. We went to the memorial and I got about halfway through that and that's about all I remember. Okay. <laughs> but it, was, it was awesome. You know, the, the, the fans came out to the memorial and, Supported everything, you know. He's he's just 
the way it should have been done for him. So it was a beautiful thing for, to send him off like that. And what was your take? Because, again, the, the media got hold of this, and it became a big thing in the press about Phil showing up into town and Rita and Vince not letting him come. Uh, were, were you privy to any of that, or, or what was sort of going on with... Uh, yeah, I mean, I was with, I was with Rita Daryl's the whole time, and I stood there, but... Um, you know, I didn't really listen to it. You know, I, I obviously there were more important things I was thinking about, but mm. um, you know, I we were drinking. Yeah. <laughs> we, I like I said, I didn't. You know, I didn't even. That's one of the reasons he's not here anymore. So yeah, that's probably why they didn't allow it. It had nothing to do with me. So. I didn't think about it. How um, much in in the aftermath? Um, uh, how how do you maintain? Or, uh, I'm trying to think about how to best word this. After Vinny sees it and his brother, who I mean, because they're not like brothers, they spent all their time together and toured the world together. How how do you try to support Vinny? Eventually, to the point where he you know, might come out of this depression and he ends up playing with, with hell. Yeah. But as, as a friend, how, how do you try to work with him and, and support him, you know, j- during this time in the aftermath? Um, you know, just did, did whatever I could for him, you know, and, you know, we hung out a lot afterwards, obviously, but, you know, I had to go on tour again with Manson, but, you know, we'd come through town and, Penny would come out and we'd hang out and, you know, uh, I'd come to Texas or back home. I guess I say Texas because touring was my home at that time. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, come back, back to Texas and, uh, you know, we'd hang out. We'd do, uh, I mean, pit bars, you know, yeah. sporting <laughs> events. <laughs> Sporting events, all that good stuff. He was the best man at my wedding, which I, I'm no longer married to her, but Vinny was my best man then because Daryl was going to be, and that happened in uh, March um, 2005. So it was pretty much right after, but Daryl was going to be my best man. Yeah. So Vinny stepped up, and he was my best man, you know, and he did a lot for me for that. He, uh did my bachelor party and all that good stuff, which was out of control. (laughs) Um, You know, just hanging out and just being there when I could for him, you know. And through the hell yeah stuff, when he was starting that out, I was filming a lot for him. So you were doing work with them as well then? A little bit in the beginning, yeah. But that was just when I was off tour with it. You know, I was in between Manson and Slipknot at that time. So Mm. when I could, I'd come you know, film for him or do whatever and just hang out. But, and then what did you think of, of a hell yeah as well? I love their first album. Yeah. You know, he played that for me. Uh, and I was like, wow, that's, you know, it's fresh sounding and, and different sound, different sounding. Cause that first album was, I really liked it. The, mm. Um, I mean, I like a lot of it. A lot of it's really good and polished, you know, like great sounding, you know. A lot, if you listen to that stuff on, on 12 or on some really good headphones, you know, just check it out and listen. It's great sounding stuff. I mean, I think the tone and the record sound better. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The tones were amazing. Those guys were good together. They could write some serious, serious stuff together, you know. I, I supported it all the way. And how do you end up, um, so again, this, this was quite, you know, this ends up being really surprising as well to, to lose Vince at, what, I think he was 53 or something, but, um, uh, how, how did you hear about it? Cause he, he has a heart attack, I think. And I assume that, you know, from the, but everyone has told me that you'd always find him with a drink in hand, no matter what. So I assume that that might have possibly uh, co- contributed to it. But, um, how, how did the news hit you? Um, uh, Rita called me that night and just she told me they found Vinny, you know, and that was that. And, yep, you know, once again, mm. 
Uh, something really, really, really tough to deal with. Last one, now we lose them both, and you know, yeah. just not, not anything that you ever want to deal with. Well, one of one of the things that has surprised me out of this, and I'm sure that you've got an opinion uh, on it as well, is um, you know Phil Anselmo goes on to do his Illegals project, which seems to be his his touring band for the moment now, um, and he pays a lot of um, lip service and tribute at every show to, to Dime and Vinny now. And uh, he's doing pretty much full sets of Pantera music. Uh, I mean, what do you think about that? Because I, I share your opinion that, that I think he's, he, he was the, the reason for the breakup of the band. Yeah. Yeah. That is the truth, but you know, he's, uh, he's come a long way since then. I've seen him a bunch mm-hmm. since, uh, since Daryl died and since Vinny died. Uh, I've seen him once since Vinny died, actually. But anyway, <clears throat> he's come a long way. He's, he's not doing drugs, you know. He's, he's uh, expressed his, his apologies and everything to everybody. I mean, I know Vinny, Vinny would never forgive him, you know, and Daryl, I'm not so sure. Daryl might have, but... But you know, I'm not I'm not one to hold grudges because as as we all know, we're we're here and we're going. Life is short, huh? Yeah. And there's no reason for me to hold a grudge against Phil or, or Rex or anybody. I, that, I mean, there are plenty of reasons, but I choose not to. You know. But, so, would you say that you have a relationship still with either one of them? Um. Well, yeah. I mean, we talk occasionally about things, or you know. I, I saw Rex a couple months ago. We talked a little bit. He calls me every now and then. I'll call him. We just talk about, you know, other things, you know, regular shit we used to talk about. Um, Phil likes to email, so I've talked to him a few times through that, and I've seen him at some shows a few times. Mm. He's always, you know, he's... He's, uh, he's good these days. It's good to see him like that because that's the feel I remember from, you know, Cowboys from Hell, Vulgar Display of Power, Far Beyond Driven. Mm. That's, that's where he's at. He's back to that guy. In the appearances the guy, that I've, the guy that I knew. Yeah, in the appearances that I've seen with him, that, that sort of sense of humor seems to have returned and not that, uh, exactly. Not that, um, as I said, that, that sort of trend kill reinventing character yep. that was around for a few years. Yeah, exactly right. So, so he's back. So, look yeah. as as we start to wrap up, Bobby. I'll, I'll just ask you a few more questions. I mean, you know, we've talked as uh, I thank you for allowing me to ask as many questions as I had. Hey. Um, yep. as, as I said, I've I've been reading about the band since since I picked up Cowboys from Hell from Columbia House. I have been reading yep. about this band for twenty plus years now. Um, what what's your favorite album by them? And I mean, not, um, not the memories associated with it, but what album do you actually think stands stands atop amongst it? Well, I mean, personally, I like Far Beyond Driven the best. You know, I think Strength Beyond Strength says it all right off the bat, and that and that song and that sets the tone for Pantera right there for for everything. But you know, Vulgar Display Powers and great album um but i think yeah far beyond driven is my favorite you know is it it's the aggressiveness of it you reckon yeah 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 it's the diversity you know from strength beyond strength five minutes alone to to becoming you know hard lines and sunken cheeks yeah it's Uh. it's it's different, you know. It always, uh, I always found it very interesting because there's a lot of people I know who say that they like Pantera, but they only like those first two albums. And I am very yeah. much the the last three in the live album. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I love them all, but I think Far Beyond is my favorite. What? Um, that's the one I'll put on when I'm in the car and you know going somewhere, crank it up to twenty and go with it, you know. Well, you've imprinted memories on me because as soon as um, Strength Beyond Strength starts, all I can think about is the Green Hulk trashing dressing rooms. <laughs> you know who that is, <laughs> right? No. Kirk Winstein. Is it really? Yeah, right. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. yeah. He's, got, he's got some new stuff out that's really cool right now. That's so odd because he looks like a Hulk in it, but Weinstein's oh, yeah. only like five foot. <laughs> he's, he's, he's a little guy. I mean, um, he's, he's a monster. <laughs> what's, um, Obviously. Tell us what you're doing in the background. What, what's going on with um, you know more footage and, and dime vision activity? Um, well, you know, in 2000, me and Daryl, uh, 2001, we were working on the new home video. Um, so I had actually just bought a house in Kansas where my family's from. So I was living there and I'd, I'd take footage back there and sort through it and, and get, gather clips and stuff while he was down in Texas doing what he was doing. But, uh, you know, we got a, I accumulated quite, a, you know, 50 some hours of footage, you know, together for the new home video. But, you know, after, after the things that went on with, uh, Phil and Rex and Pantera, we just, and they started damage plan, we just put it on hold. So, mm. so that's on hold. And, you know, we did the Dying Vision 3 or 2 and then, uh, um, we were going to start working on the Pantera video. That's right. I, f- I completely forgot about that because the, the teaser came out, what, a year and a half ago or something? Yeah, yeah. So is yeah. that how – what's going on with it? Oh, shit. I, I completely forgot, forgot about that. What is going so on with that? That's what I was saying. Daryl and I worked on it a little bit in 2001 and got a lot of footage together, but it didn't go anywhere because uh, what happened with them with uh, Phil Rex you yeah. know, and their – and damage plan, but um, so anyway, we did the Dime Vision two, and Vinny Vinny produced that executive producer. So we were he was he was my go to guy, you know, pretty much on the business side of things with Pantera stuff. So he was going to be like my executive producer type of thing on the Pantera home video. So. Mm. You know, I was getting it together and we just got three out, or shoot, why do I keep saying that? We just got a Dime Vision 2 out, you know, the previous year and, and we took a little break and then we were going to start working on the fourth one for Pantera. And, you know, I was talking to Vinny about it and how, how we're going to do it and, you know, all this stuff. And then obviously he passed away. So it's, it's been put on hold again, so you know it's it's a tougher situation now. Mm. You know, as far as everybody's got a little piece of somebody's estate, and there's oh, yeah. two more, and there's two more two band members, and there's a record company, and there's the rights to the music, there's rights to the p, there's just there's management, there's just a whole a whole. Uh, forest of red tape. <laughs> mm. do, you, do, you, do you think it will see the light of day or do you, do you think it's been sort of a effectively yeah. canned? Yeah. No, it'll see the light of day for sure. But we got to wait but five people, years or people, something. People keep asking me and I can't give them an answer. I don't know. <laughs> you no, know, I'm doing what I can. Yeah. And you know, it will, it will see the light of day one way or another. Is there, uh, just before we, we wrap up, um, so again, thank you for your time. Is, um, is there a particular memory, uh, of Dime and Vince or, or an interesting thing that you'd like to share with people listening? Um, I mean, a lot of the, the memories are in the videos, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, shoot, I mean, every day on tour, you know, it was just like, it was me and Vinny, or Daryl, Vinny, me, you know, Sterling, uh, Big Val on our bus. And uh, so a day on our bus was we'd roll into the gig. Vinny would be up usually taking care of business, you know. He'd be inside warming up. We'd get, I'd come out and get Daryl up around three or four or whatever, depending on press. We'd go inside, you know, like I was saying earlier, get warmed up, you know, 45 before the show, he'd start doing shots. We'd start getting loose, and everybody would do shots. The crew would come in. They'd do shots. Band would come in. We'd take shots over to Phil's room. Phil had his 
room, you know, we'd, we'd do shots with everybody and he'd be warming up and never missed a, a lick anyway. They'd do the show, totally kick the ass. We'd, we'd get back to, this is the funny stuff, we'd get back to the dressing room and Daryl Daryl would be sweating his ass off, you know, trying to get a, a bite of Taco Bell <laughs> and, a, and a bottle of water or whatever. And Vinny would be putting his jeans on and blow drying his hair. <laughs> going, let's go, let's go, motherfuckers, come on. Time's running out, let's go. And Daryl would just be sitting there worn the fuck out, like, what now, what? And, you know, tip bar, Vinny Paul, <laughs> tip bar, let's go. We're going to tip bar, we're taking the bus. Come on, Wiggins is out there ready to drive, let's do it. Round this shit up, let's go. Daryl would get up and chug his water, put his clothes on. And, you know, that was Pretty much every night we'd do that. It was just funny watching him and Daryl, you know, back and forth about the tip bar every night. <laughs> we, we would make the best of it, though. That wasn't Daryl's type of thing, you know. I mean, he went in and, yeah, we had fun in the tip bar, but every night, Vinnie Paul. Vinnie Paul. <laughs> it was so- it was hilarious. Were they uh, were they completely in sync? Sort of what I, what I sort of read and hear about them is that they were sort of they always seem to be like on the same page together. Yeah, yeah, I mean, musically for sure, you know, and brotherly, yes. Um, but yeah, they're two different people for sure, mm-hmm. but, but definitely in sync. Awesome. But yeah. Bobby, we've got, gone- sorry? Daryl always, Daryl always knew what Vinny was about to say. Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, look, we've gone over two hours now. I think that, that answers all of my questions, and I, I genuinely appreciate your time because I've wanted to ask these sorts of things for a number of years. Um, well, look, that's that's awesome. I really appreciate your time, and thanks, thank you for speaking with me today. Yeah, sorry about that time in Canada. Um, don't, don't know how to make that one up to you. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. No one knows what we're talking about now because that'll get edited out, but um, uh, who knows? Nah. Keep that in there. <laughs> nah, do what you gotta do.